Okay, everyone, it's Michael Shermer. It's time for another episode of The Michael Shermer Show. My guest today is Dacher Keltner, professor of psychology at the University of California, Berkeley, and the faculty director of UC Berkeley's Greater Good Science Center. A renowned expert in the science of human emotion, Dr. Keltner studies compassion and awe, how we express emotion, and how emotions guide our moral identities and the search for meaning. His research interests also span issues of power, status, inequality, and social class. He's the author of The Power Paradox and the best-selling book Born to be Good. And he's the co-editor of The Compassionate Instinct. His new book, here it is, Awe, The New Science of Everyday Wonder and How It Can Transform Your Life. Beautiful cover, Dacker. This is great. I love that kind of deep green. I guess it's... Yeah. Uh, I guess it's uh, all, all the elements there, it's stars, the forest, uh, the northern lights. <laughs> you got it all going on. Looking there. up, that's right. It's, yeah, it's uh, a, looking a shot up. of awe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, I think what I'd like to do in this conversation is start um, uh, 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 kind of narrowly focused on awe and how you yeah. study that and so on. Then we can uh, kind of branch out and talk about all emotions and evolutionary origins of emotions and all that stuff. But before we do that, just talk about your personal life a little bit. This is a personal book. You do talk about the death of your brother, but you also talk about the upbringing you and your brother had yeah. with your rather unusual <clears throat> parents. I wouldn't say these are normal <laughs> parents or upbringing. So give us a little bit of background. Yeah. You know, Michael, I mean, you've written many books and when you write a book, you often there's a, a personal inquiry involved. You're, you know, you're, you're motivated by personal reasons. And, uh, in some ways, I was meant to study awe scientifically. Um, I was raised by a, uh, uh, my mom taught literature, eventually at Cal State Sacramento. Romanticism, D.H. Lawrence, Virginia Woolf, you know, our house was filled with quotes of William Blake and the sublime. And my dad was a painter uh, and, you know, loved Goya and the horrors of Goya and, and Francis Bacon and others. And then I grew up to add, you know, to add to all of that, I was born in Mexico. Uh, where Jack Kerouac retreated to in uh, on the road, wow. and then um, I know, and then um, uh, lived in formative years in Laurel Canyon in the late 1960s, which was where a lot of rock and roll was taking place, and it was a very um, kind of wild place. So I grew up in a wild life. But here's the thing, Michael, and it's very fitting with you <laughs> and your intellectual work, which which was that uh, I wasn't very good at art. I was not good at writing, you know, fiction. Uh, even though I wanted to be. And I love statistics and numbers and dinosaurs and evolution from an early point in life. And so I was raised in this house of humanities with all these wild claims. And I was like, I'm going to test those scientifically, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so my mom talked about the power of pyramids. It was a very popular idea in the 70s. And I was, as for my science project, I grew snapdragons under a pyramid-shaped greenhouse and a regular-shaped <laughs> greenhouse. <laughs> right. So... I was born as uh, like a skeptic, you know, <laughs> That's and, really funny, <laughs> but, but grateful, so grateful that my parents raised me in a spirit of awe. So it was, it was an interesting thing to write the book and just to have all this stuff surface. Yeah. I remember the, the whole pyramid, uh, deal with the, like you put a razor blade under a pyramid, it's supposed <laughs> to get sharper and plants are supposed to grow and you have one near your bed. The sex is supposed to be better. I mean, there was a lot of crazy stuff going on back then along with hallucinogens. Well, <laughs> you put it to the test. Well, that's right. You never know what actually might work for whatever reason. So ulti yeah. ultimately it's science that, that helps us figure out what's actually true. So that's interesting. But you guys also did trips to Europe, right? If I recall. Yeah. You know, we, um, we, uh, when my brother and I were teenagers, we had this formative year in um, England when uh, I was 15 and he was 14. And again, you know, it's such a lesson in culture and awe, which is that my parents steeped in the humanities. We didn't have a lot of money for, you know, fancy dinners or beachside resorts, but, you know, we stood in museums and, you know, the Prado with Goya and the Louvre and and we went to, you know, sites of awe and just took it in. And I, um, and I write about this. I had this really interesting experience with the Dutch masters, and in particular, de Hoog, where his, he was a contemporary of Vermeer, less popular, but his everyday experiences of just quiet and peace and sublime, uh, they're still with me today. So, yeah, Europe really, I think in some sense, taught me um, 
how cultures can really orient around awe in certain ways and for the good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another topic I'm interested in that I talk about on this show is how lives turn out. So you and your brother, yeah. not not too far apart in age, essentially raised yeah. in the same home, say, similar experiences. What was his life path and how did that differ from yours and why? Yeah, you know, it's, it's fascinating. My brother, Rolf, uh, who passed away um, from colon cancer and led me in my grief to write this book, in part, alongside the science of, of all I've been doing for 10, 15 years. Um, you know, it's, it's so interesting, Michael. Um, he, uh, he was one year younger than me. Um, he ultimately gravitated to the social sciences, like I did, became a speech therapist oriented towards the poor and really helped very poor kids in the rural parts of California, like those I grew up around, uh, speak. Um, his, he was the younger of the two, and we know Frank Soloway oh, is. Birth order, <laughs> right. <laughs> and indeed, I was more conventional and status conscious and, you know, and uptight, and, and he was wild. You know, he was just... I, re I recently saw somebody who said, I grew up with you and, and I remember your brother Rolf and, and you, you know, you guys are five and four. And I was like, what were we like? And he was like, <laughs> you were really critical and judgmental. <laughs> That's really funny. I was like, funny. dang. And he's like, and your brother was wild, you know? So he was, he was wild and it, it led to some struggles. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, ultimately a pretty, pretty meaningful life, you know, with, with, uh, helping those kids. Um, he, uh, he wasn't as status conscious as me. He wasn't, a, he was freer. He, um, probably didn't work as hard as me. Um, so, but, uh, had a bigger heart and, and it's interesting, Michael, you know, when he passed, um, and this book is about the awe and horror and, and transformation of grief. Um, one of the things I realized is how my brother was really kind, uh, just preternaturally kind. And when he went, I was, I was like, where do I find my kindness? You know? And so, um, it, it was a, a lesson in two joined lives. And when one of them ends, the one that remains has to find what was lost. Mm. For my listeners, uh, not familiar with Frank Soloway's birth order theory, he presents this in yeah. born to rebel. And it's a kind of a Darwinian model of how siblings compete within a family dynamic for status, for love, for attention, resources of parents, which are limited by necessity. So you got to do something. What is the strategy? The idea is that firstborns become something like surrogate parents. So by definition, they're almost authoritative, rule-bound, rule, rule, bound, rule enforcing. Whereas later borns, just by definition, they're later, so they're smaller, they're slower, they're not as physical, and and so on, and and or developed intellectually, so they have to do something else other than the traditional kind of standard way of getting uh, love and attention and status from parents and in the family. So they uh, diverge out into other professions and other ways of being that are different. And you know, this is a statistical on average, you know, a huge sample size kind of thing. Obviously, there's exceptions within any particular family, but on average, later borns tend to, you know, kind of be more like what you just described with your brother. Uh, you are more likely as a firstborn to be an academic, right? And yeah, get no, on the path and get tenure and, and, and publish yeah. and all that kind of uh, regular stuff. So anyway, that's the idea behind it. There, there are, there's some pushback and criticisms of it, but it's, an, I really like it. I think it's an interesting Me too. theory. Very so much. you were there when your brother died? Yeah. Thanks for asking, Michael. You know. Um, one of the um, points of what well, it led me to write the book was the grief. I, uh, Rolf had colon cancer uh, for two years, which is a horror show. And, you know, he's a big guy, uh, 6'1", 6'2", 210, and, and it just reduced him to nothing. And, and then he uh, passed away on January 26. I wasn't there actually when he actually passed, but up until the, the last hour or two. And importantly, you know, it was fascinating the whole buildup to that moment was horror. Um, you know, just watching a body experience pain and really um, uh, be decimated by colon cancer. And then seeing him in this, and he took a, a cocktail to end his life, 
seeing him in this state of approaching the end, um, and and we were all around him, and I literally, I mean, it felt like a kind of a Renaissance painting with the light and the calm and the quiet and his face kind of influencing all of us. And it, for me, Michael, I don't know where you stand, but I hadn't, you know, I wasn't raised with a religious tradition. I'm more of a kind of a biological type. So I'm like, there goes the body, that's it. And, and a loved one's death does raise big questions about, you know, metaphysical, quantum physical questions. What's life? Where does it go? You know? And so I was in a state of, of mystery and awe um, that night. And then after just crashed. So it was, it was a striking life defining experience. What do you mean you crashed? Oh man. Emotionally. You know, yeah. You know, I, I actually have studied grief scientifically. You know, we know the first six months are just chaos. That was true. Chaos in the sense of you can't make sense of things. You you heart, you have trouble sleeping. You have trouble eating. I was overheated. My inflammation response was high. Um, I think part of it was that because I saw so much of life through the eyes of my brother and interpreted things with his mind. With him gone, I was like, I, I just didn't have, know what to do. And it persisted. I really, um, I really fell into, you know, a state of grief that really the best description I've read is Joan Get Didion's book, um, The Year of Magical Thinking, I think, where I was hallucinating. I felt his hand on my back twice, like literally like, there it is. I saw him times heard his voice. It was, it was profound. Uh, and I was disoriented. Yeah. Interesting. Well, of course, no one knows what happens when you die. Someone dies, yeah. uh, perhaps, yeah. you know, they go somewhere. We don't know. There's not enough evidence yeah. to determine one way or the other, probably go nowhere. It's probably in the same place they were before you were born, but yeah. you know, but for sure, um, what one way or the other, you have to deal with it in the here and now because we, we're not in the hereafter, right? So um, how do you process, I mean, we used to think of awe, like back to the cover of your beautiful book here, you know, being out in the woods and having this, you know, grand positive experience of nature. Grief d doesn't seem like it's the same kind of thing. What's the connection with of grief and, and awe? Thank you for asking that. No one's asked that question. Um, you know, most cultures, um, most cultures have, a lot of ceremonies and rituals around dying and, and philosophies around dying. A lot of the Himalayan Buddhist traditions just have impermanence reflection exercises about death. They teach in grammar school and, and we don't. And so when I saw my brother pass, um, the, the end of life is a mystery. And we actually have found it's a universal source of all. Like, wow, what happens? What is that? How do I make sense of this? That's all. Um, grief is a state, an emotional state, an ideational state where um, one of my collaborators on awe called awe destabilizing. Knowledge comes in and it, you know, and Darwin started to have all these awesome experiences with nature and geology and like it destabilized his notions of Christian understandings of the natural world. And that's what grief is. It's, it's where you are you know, you're, you're just your basic idea of social reality. I have a brother, we share, we call to each other, we'll understand things together, is gone. And my, my beliefs were just suspended and, and I was really prone to awe, you know, to um, alternative kinds of events I wouldn't ordinarily experience, his hand on my back, expansive feelings of wonder. Everything seemed new, you know, because it no longer was, my brother and I making sense of the world. So it, it has the quality, the, the noetic quality, knowing of a big spiritual experience, a near death experience, you know, which you've mentioned. Um, and, and so grief and awe are very intertwined and there's a new literature on post traumatic growth like grief where we grow out of grief. And I think awe will prove to be one of the key pathways to such growth. Mm. Do you think our just Western culture has not dealt well with teaching people how to think about this until it actually happens? Here I'm thinking of, I've, I've had two similar experiences to yours. My mother died after being in a coma after hitting her head. She had brain tumors for about 10 mm -hmm. years. And so mm -hmm. she died right there in front of me, uh, you know, in, in a um, kind of a hospice type situation. And then my brother, 
also old, uh, my, uh, this was an older stepbrother. So I wasn't super close to him because by the time my <clears throat> parents, uh, my mom married my stepdad, he was like nine, 10 years older than me and he was gone yeah. within a few years. So I wasn't super close to him, but you know, I, I, of course we were brothers and he died colon cancer uh, also in a yeah. hospital. Yeah. You know, it just as it was one of these things I thought we had more time and then the organs started failing and then he's in a coma and then it's like, you better get down here. I'm like, oh crap, okay. Yeah. And, but it's also clinical and cold and, you know, my parents never talked to me about this. I didn't grow up in any kind of culture that said, by the way, this is kind of the cycle of life and how to think about it or whatever. Is that a problem you think? Because you mentioned this other cultures deal with this from an early stage, whereas we just kind of just fall into it. I, I think it's a profound problem, and there's the problem, you know, a lot of cultures, Mexican Day of the Dead, in Tibet, they have these water-burying rituals where they bury dead bodies and disassemble them for days, right? They, they, they consecrate the life. Uh, in Japan, they have the Day of the Ancestors when ancestors come visit. It's, a, it's worldwide. It's universal. And we've lost that. We've lost the ritual of it. Um, and so that makes grief really hard. It's hospitalized. Um, you know, I, uh, did a lot of work with medical doctors during the pandemic with thousands of them. And, you know, they're watching people die in bags, um, by medical necessity. So it's a huge problem in how grieving individuals like myself who are not religious respond and find their way again. And, and it was a titanic struggle for me. And then the broader problem is, you know, in some sense, we're a victim of our own success, which is that, you know, around the world, people are living into their 70s and 80s. We don't see people die as much. We have medicine that takes care of the pain of it, which is good. But then we, we, sh we shunt it off into hospitals. And, and, you know, we don't, I've been thinking a lot about this because, um, you know, in teaching the science of happiness. In many ways, when you watch people die, things become more precious or reverential and sacred, um, for, which happened to me. Um, and we don't have, in a lot of Western European contexts, um, philosophies of, of what it means to die. We don't get kids to think about it. Um, for those of you who have raised kids out, there, kids out there, some of your children may have had trouble with death anxiety. What happens? You know, I had my younger daughter did, Serafina. I had no way to talk to her about it. And it's, it is, you know, it's a Darwinian universal. It's an engine of evolution. It's just part of everything is death. And we don't talk about it. And so I hope, I hope this conversation mm -hmm. uh, gets others to get into the act and, and sort of broaden our conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I have a six-year-old now and he, the fish at the school just died. <laughs> and he's like, oh, what is that? Where, oh. where, where did it go? And and then it was like, what happens? No, wait a minute. If you guys die and I'm still here, you know, and I'm, I'm like, oh, God, he's only six. Is this when I have to have this conversation? <laughs> yeah. And I will tell you, I was in Bhutan for some National Geographic work. And, you know, and, and they just talk about impermanence as if mm. it's like, eating your protein, you know, it's like, okay, here are the five exercises. Imagine your mom dying. Imagine your dad dying. I'm like, what? You know, <laughs> and they're much, they're much, you, you look at our anxiety levels in the United States, twice as high as many other countries. Maybe that's part of mm -hmm. the reason. Yeah. Also, I think, um, to, you know, give some credit to religion, uh, although I'm an atheist, I'm not super militant about it. And I try to recognize yeah. the positive roles. I know of religion, which maybe this is one of those that we've kind of overlooked. You know, the humanists kind of touch on it a little bit. They have like a humanist ceremony for weddings and funerals and things like that. But I don't think it's the same as the depth that religion has dealt with this. You know, when, I mean, and there are wonderful books on this. I think there's a book by Wellman on the different philosophical traditions that emerge out of grappling with death, right? And you can be agnostic or atheistic or develop your cosmological views of it. But, you know, I was just in Bhutan and so much of Buddhism is, it is impermanent. Our lives are impermanent. That flower, this season, your grandmother, it's all a cycle. And then they have their views of where life goes, the repeating lives. Yeah, you know, we're, we skeptic, secular types, humanist types <laughs> are shocked by this inevitability. And I was. So, and I don't mean to, to to belittle it. It's profound, right? It's it's just a big question of how we 
make sense of it. Well, this is one of the you know kind of contributions of your book is you know building a literature uh, around this through secular, yeah. scientific, <clears throat> rational. Thank you. Arguments. By the way, you didn't mention this in the book. Maybe you've dealt with it elsewhere. The you know, these ancient burials, Neanderthals, hundred thousand years ago. And so on. Do, do you have a sense of what they might have been thinking? I mean, these aren't accidental burials. They have grave goods and flowers in there, and so on. You can't help but wonder what were they thinking. I think, I think you know. Thank what a spectacular observation, Michael. And I'm I'm embarrassed I didn't uh, mention that. You know, one of the sources of awe and reverence and we call it our eighth wonder, I call it the eighth wonder in this book, is, is just the appreciation of the life cycle. It begins and it ends. And I am struck by within that wonder of, whoa, people are born, it's spring, things grow, and then they end, and it's a repeating cycle that Darwin was curious about um, and others. Um, I think there is this, come out of awe for that comes reverence. You know, that that is sacred. It's it's fundamental. It's not you can't put a price tag on it. And with sacred things, we consecrate them. We, we have rituals. We, you know, we have ceremonies around them and life is sacred. And so it's striking to me that and I'm thank you for that reference that it begins so early in our hominid mm -hmm. evolution. Yeah, well, so, yeah, at some point, some uh, hominid realized uh we're going to die. And, yeah. <laughs> wait, is this going to happen to me? <laughs> and I want to look good when I'm in there. You yeah. know? <laughs> no, but I think it's, I think it's more than vanity. I think it's, you know, life protecting life is an evolutionary prerogative. It's, and, and it's just, you know, so we do our best stuff to protect life and to honor it. Okay. Let's get into the, how a scientist studies awe. So how do you operationally yeah. define the concept? You have to measure it somehow. What's the, yeah. what's the reliability of self-report data? You know, the, yeah. how do you know somebody feels a certain way when you know, <laughs> they just have their words and you ask them and you hope that they're thinking the same thing you're thinking? What, what, yeah. are, the, what are the problems there? <laughs> Thank you. Now, I'm, now <laughs> thanks for asking those questions. Yeah, you know, it's, there's an interesting irony here, you know, Michael, which is I've studied all kinds of different emotions and people think that awe is beyond science. And in actuality, it's a, a pretty easy emotion to study scientifically, and there's a lot of work on it now. Um, I define awe in the spirit of the great Irish philosopher Edmund Burke, uh, whose brilliant book, Inquiry into the Sublime and the Beautiful, or something like that, 1757 or 9, um, as the feeling you have when you encounter vast mysteries. Vast can be physical. I'm standing next to Shaquille O'Neal. It can be temporal. Whoa, I just thought about my childhood. It can be semantic, like, wow, the theory of evolution accounts for everything. So vastness and then mystery. I don't understand what's going on, right? I have this no set of knowledge structures that are my mind, and it can't make sense of my brother's hand on my back or the pattern of stars in the sky, what have you. So that's the feeling of awe. It produces a state of wonder. You know, I'm curious about the world. Um, you know, it's, it's fascinating, Michael. Um, people will ask me, you know, <clears throat> uh, I had this experience where, you know, I was, um, I was assigned a, a room in a dorm and I was assigned the room of, my, of a young guy who was the son of my dad's college roommate and we were in the same room, dorm room, you know. Ah, and, and is that all? And... And you, the way we measure awe to answer that question is, it's this constellation of responses. When people feel awe, the word will come to them. They will feel small and insignificant. They will feel like there's some vast thing out there, like a, an ecosystem or an idea that they're part of. They will feel really what William James called saintly tendencies. They'll, you just have this like, I want to um, serve, I want to give, I want to cooperate. And then the body gets into the act and we can measure awe with tears, which are a parasympathetic autonomic response. Chills, certain kinds of pyloerection chills up your back and arms. The vagus nerve is activated during awe, which is a big bundle of nerves that calms your heart and your breathing. And then even the default mode network, a region of the brain involved in self-representation is activated. 
So it's fascinating. You put those 10 things together and we feel pretty good saying that person's feeling awe, right? They're talking about vast mystery. They report it. And what I, I think is important here is, um, you know, you mentioned self-report, how reliable are self-report. They predict things with 0.3, you know, 0.4. Uh, and um, I, like Edmund Burke, oh, it really was skeptical of using a word to capture the whole phenomena. Uh, and, and we can measure the different re the branches of, of behavior and nervous system physiology that are awe. And the other, of course, is our behavior, right? Whoa. You know, wow. You know, and people, we published a paper uh, in Nature recently, Alan Cowan, that around the world, in 144 countries, when people see fireworks, they go, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a, that is part of the package. So I believe we should really look at this full set of responses to understand this complicated. So it's a, a cluster of, of features, not unlike yeah. diagnosing a mental illness. You look in the DSM and there's you know, like, here's 27 features of schizophrenia. If the patient has 20 of them, then it tips it over into that category and supposed to some other category. And it's fairly predictive of, of what we're looking yeah. for. Yeah. Yeah. So I was going to give you an example here from Carl Sagan, one of my, one of, to me, one of the most spiritual scientists I've known here. That, why do you say that? Well, I'll, I'll tell you why, because the opening scene of Cosmos, I'm going to read you his, his little, uh, the script. He's, so remember, he's standing on the cliffs of the Pacific Ocean right in Big Sur at one of those, uh, you know, like 100 feet up. Esalen. Up, yeah, Esalen, yeah, just below the Esalen Institute there. And this is when he says, and, and, and so the, the, the footage is of the waves crashing sort of in slow motion against the rocks. The universe is all that is or ever was or ever will be. Our mm. contemplations of the cosmos stir us. There's a tingling in the spine, a catch in the voice, a faint sensation as if a distant memory of falling from a great height. We know we are approaching the grandest of mysteries. And then they show some more of that footage. And he says, the cosmos mm. is within us. We are made of star stuff. And we've begun at last to wonder about our origins. Star stuff, contemplating the stars. Organized collections of 10 billion, billion, billion atoms. Contemplating, contemplating the evolution of matter. Tracing that long path by which it arrived at consciousness. Here on planet Earth and perhaps throughout the cosmos. Our obligation to survive and flourish is owed not just to ourselves, but also to that cosmos, ancient and vast, from which we spring. Man. Wow. wow. Yeah. 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 You know, and what I love about that, and, and in the book, I, you know, one of the things that I did writing this, Michael, and thank you for that quote. I, I didn't, I had other experiences with Sagan, but not that one. That's an awe experience, right? It, it's about the small self and connected to the vastness and, and the grand trajectory of time and, and then the made of this, this life dust or whatever he calls it, star stuff, that, that very much returns in many experiences of awe, right? Emerson kind of having an experience in uh, a museum where he really thought about uh, American transcendentalism, Darwin kind of thinking about uh, the grandeur of nature um, and, uh, and even mystical experiences. And I know you've thought about you know, the structure of religious thought. And so awe animates so many great insights like that, where we really start to see our place in the universe. So thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, so it's a way that anybody could be spiritual. Again, yeah. that's one of those loaded words, you know, I'm spiritual, yeah. but not religious. Well, what does that mean? Well, in a way you're talking about, that's what you're talking about, right? Yeah. I, you know, it was, it was so interesting because, um, in our study of eight wonders of awe, mysticism, spirituality was one of them. Not as common as I thought they would be around the world, but definitely part of uh, that. And, <clears throat> and uh, I'm not a religious person, so I, as I've said, and, and so I interviewed ministers, I read up on the science of religion, some of your writing and other thinking, and, and you know, I uh, really think and I adhere to the view that, as you say, you know, Americans, thanks to people like William James and Ralph Waldo Emerson and Margaret Fuller, enjoy a pluralism of spirituality. They can feel spiritual 
in prayer, in chanting, in sacred texts, in backpacking. 40% of Americans consider nature to be divine, psychedelics, etc. And what's happening is they are finding awe in these sources. It, like that Sagan quote of, I am part of something vast. And, and, and then arriving at spiritual thought about it, you know, and, and identifying what is sacred in it. And what's been fun to teach awe is that, it, you know, I, like you, am worried about the really harsh skeptics of religion, given how religious people and spiritual people are. Awe is a way to ask people about their sense of the spirit or what transcends the physical world, you know, how it arises in music and the like. So. Uh, I think it's oh, it will open up new forms of inquiry mm -hmm. in the science of spirituality. I love how you ended uh, quoting from Darwin's final chapter, final pa uh, uh, paragraph from Origin of Species. Here's another one from Darwin I liked. When I view all beings, not as special creations, but as the lineal descendants of some few beings which live long before the first bed of the Cambrian mm. system was deposited, they seem to me to become ennobled ennobled it's like but it's just a fossil <laughs> yeah but we're connected all the way back to the pre-cambrian it's like that that's what you mean right that's awe inspiring it is and it was emerson you know he had this uh, massive epiphany in this museum in the jardin des plantes in paris which led to all of his writing about nature which is so influential where he sees all these skeletons of different species and he sees their commonalities like darwin did and he's just like I will be a naturalist. And what he meant is I will in nature find what I think I feel to be divine. Um, and yeah, you know, there's this quality of awe that we have not captured scientifically, but it, it, it in, in little findings here and there, which is out of any experience of awe, for the most part, you could like the conspiratorial types of experiences you write about, one might be a, an exception. You feel that people are noble. You know, you feel they mean well, they are trying, they have a, a, a good core to them. Um, so that's a stunning quote. Yet again, thank you, Michael. That <laughs> I should have had that one as well. So um All right, let's what, look what at an some of the, figure. Let's look at some of the predictors of awe. So you have nature, yeah. music, art, dance, movement, exercise, love, friendships. Just go through some of the data and research you have on this. What what predicts awe and what do, what, yeah. what is it does not lead to it so much? Yeah, you know, if awe is your feeling about vast mysteries, how you respond to vast mysteries, um, within the the field of emotion, philosophers have pressed us to say that doesn't do enough. You gotta you gotta figure out what's called the intentional object, like what's the focus of consciousness uh, in an emotion. Um, and so we surveyed 2,600 people, 26 countries, and came up with these eight wonders. And each, I devote a chapter to each in the major scientific findings. And, you know, they're, they're amazing. Moral beauty, right? The kindness and courage of other people. There are studies that show if I just see a video of some, you know, um, stranger who helps or this young kid who was hurt in a car crash, and had all these surgeries and forgave the man who hurt him intentionally, um, I, I am ennobled. I share more resources. I tear up. I'll give, it'll countervail racism. Moral beauty is one. Um, you know, the, I'll just give you the big three first, see what your thoughts are. Um, the second one is nature, very obviously. There's a huge literature on the awe we feel in nature you know, just how it affects us in, through our sensory systems and the patterns like Darwin saw uh, and the calm and the quiet. We did a study of veterans rafting for a day on a part of the American River in California that my brother and I used to raft on. And just rafting for a day, because of awe, a week later, they had 30% less PTSD, right? Yeah, so the, the wild awe of nature and how it teaches us stuff. And then the third <clears throat> is fascinating, is collective effervescence, just moving with people, dancing with people, playing sports, watching sports, political rallies, the waves, rituals, 
we're constantly synchronizing. You know, babies start synchronizing really early in life. And in certain moments, when we, as Emil Durkheim wrote, when we share attention in the synchrony, we're all synchronizing about the football player and cheering the Pittsburgh Steelers, you know, or whatever, um, you will feel awe. You'll be like, and it'll almost be spiritual. Like, wow, God, you know. <laughs> um, and so there's an amazing science of synchrony and collective ritual and awe and just how we sync up and feel one uh, in those moments. So the first three domains to consider are, you know, moral beauty, nature, and collective effervescence. Yeah. Yeah, I just recorded an episode with a woman <clears throat> named L. Hardy who wrote a book on Pentecostalism. And mm. what came out of that was how uh, kind of emotionally engaging their church services are. They are not boring. You are not sitting there getting lectured to. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> a good academic lecture stands no chance. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, another wonder is religion and spirituality. And, you know, I'd be curious to hear what you think, Michael, but I love kind of this new science of cultural evolution and 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 religion with, with, that advances the idea that religions are almost like, I hate to use this phrase, like awe amusement parks, you know, they use all the tools of awe that we've been evolving for millions of years, you know, beautiful images and tall forest-like structures and touching and giving and rituals and chanting and singing. And, and next thing you know, you're tearing up and you know, you're feeling spiritual. One of the things are, uh, I noticed early on in studying New Age movements and groups is they always congregate in these really gorgeous places like Sedona, Arizona, <laughs> and, you know, Esalon Institute, and Big Sur, and Hawaii. You know, they're never out like the middle of the desert where there's nothing. Right? Yeah, the parking lot in Fresno. <laughs> yeah, <you know? laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I called that intelligent design, yes, which is, I like that. you know, yeah, it's like, that's the real intelligent design uh, in the feeling of awe within religion is, you know, religions like sporting events, like a great political rally, use a lot of the sources of awe to, to make you devoted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, political rallies, right. So re recall George W. Bush and Al Gore's debates where Al was basically lecturing with PowerPoint slides and, uh -huh. and Bush was the guy you wanted to go have a beer with, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> It's like, yeah. Democrats keep losing. Uh, I they know. Well, often lose and that And Trump, one. you know, for I'm not a big Trump fan, as everybody listening to this knows, but uh, but he is a good speaker. He, I mean, he can go on for yeah. hours at these rallies. Yeah. He just has preternatural energy. He seems to yeah. read the audience, and and, and there's he, he's off script most of the time because he's just sort of seeing how the response is. And, and And, you know, and people, you know, I've been talking with people recently. There's a rise in the interest of the emotional dynamics of political movements fear-based movements, rage-based movements, and on. And, and I think, you know, for those of us who were not uh, supporters of Trump and we watched his rallies, you know, I remember Dave Eggers reporting on it, who actually went to them and he said, the Democrats are in trouble, you know, because the, the awe and vitality at these rallies is, is, is on fire. And, and it's a fascinating, you know, awe is very contagious, Michael. When people tell stories of awe, other people get moved, you know, and literature is a cultural representation of the stories of awe, often, or myths and the like. And uh, we got to watch out for the contagious mm -hmm. power of awe. It can be striking. Or just develop it. It's a different kind of, it's not a lecture. <laughs> yeah. Right? You're, it's yes. A, <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. A couple other things. So I sent you some pictures of Steve Pinker and I out, out riding yeah. in the, on the, oh. on the coast. But those yeah. pictures is when it was when he was in town. It was a massive storm, and the waves and the dark skies and all. I have similar pictures from the same places when it's clear blue sky. It's beautiful, but it's not the same as with the storms and the clouds and the crashing waves and the darkness. I don't know what it. What is the difference? One is beautiful and the other is awe inspiring. You just gave me goosebumps with that question <laughs> because it took us ten years to answer that empirically. Thank you. And, and it's, this, it's a defining question in the 18th century study of all of Edmund Burke first and then Immanuel Kant. They were like, how is beauty rolling, you know, waves, an ocean, a horizon, beach versus awe, the sublime? Uh, you know, what you described very aptly, Michael, of like, whoa, you know, dark clouds and the like. And it, it has to do 
uh, with the presence of mystery, right? You know, that you just, with those dark clouds, you don't know if you're out physically on your bike, might they produce lightning storms, right? And there's an element of mystery and danger that the beauty doesn't have. And then beauty uh, tends to be a little less vast. So in our research, nature scenes, for those photographers out there uh, that are more beautiful, they tend to be more human scale. The off photography tends to be vast, like shooting up into the redwoods. Um, and, and I think that, um, that's a critical distinction, uh, both for the science of emotion and then thinking about evolution, which is we have good accounts for why we really like beautiful faces and nature landscapes, E.O. Wilson and the like. But now we've got this realm of vast mystery that we have to explain that really is different subjectively, as you suggest. Mm. Right. Didn't uh, Burke talk about certain colors like red and black and Did contrasted he? with, you know, that, that, that were more yeah. awe invoking, I think. I, I was just, when you were talking, I was thinking of Edvard Munch's The Scream. You know, it has black and dark and red. And I don't know, you look at that and it is, I don't know if it's awe-inspiring or scary or mysterious or what, but it's, it's not beautiful. No, it's not. And, and that moon scream, like a lot of art, like Goya's work, and I write about this in the visual art chapter, there, you know, Goya did these paintings of war that are horrifying, but they're aesthetized. They have beauty in them. And so because they're art, they astonish us with the awe of how we can be horrible, horrible to each other. Um, I didn't know that about Burke. That, that is such a great book. Uh, that is why well, I, I recommend. So nice to know he Let's thought see, uh, that the, about colors. The Goya painting, which, which is the, the uh, Guernica, the painting from the Spanish Civil War. Picasso, yeah. The, that's Picasso, yeah. I thought of uh, that uh, reading your book because I had read Ken Miller's book, his last book, I don't know, two years ago or so. He kind of cool. took on the biophilia hypothesis of Ed Wilson, you know, the idea yeah. that we evolved to like these landscapes that are like a, a, a African savanna with the kind of, uh, a, you know, a clumps of trees and a body of water and some <laughs> cows. And, you know, basically Miller goes, this is like a Motel 6 painting on the wall, right? I mean, it's okay. It's, it's lovely, but it's boring. So he uses, yeah. he uses the Guernica, uh, Picasso's Guernica. It's not beautiful. It's not biophilic. It's awe-inspiring. It's like this is war. Yeah. I mean, come yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. But I would counter that we would need to separate the feeling of beauty from the experience of awe in understanding aesthetic mm. responses, mm. and maybe both have some plausibility. Different. Okay, so different emotions, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Before we get into that, though, just a couple. Of, so you measured. The studies measuring physiological changes, there were what lower stress hormones and things like that. Yeah, you know, part of my reason for writing this book, um, you know, as you know, Michaels, I do a lot of teaching of happiness and well being to healthcare settings and the like. And I care a lot about how our science, much as you care about how our science can inform cultural political debate um, and keep it you know, oriented towards facts, I also care about uh, how our science can benefit people. And, you know, I've taught human happiness to tens of thousands of people, gratitude and compassion and meditation and mindfulness and et cetera. And along comes a science of awe, which is only 10 years old, eight to 10 years old. And what we know is it activates the vagus nerve, which is very good for your heart, decreases default mode network. It reduces inflammation which is the cytokine system of your immune system, releasing proteins that, cat, that kill pathogens. Great in the short term, but if you're always inflamed, it's very dangerous for your body. Awe reduces that. Um, awe has uh, relationships to cortisol. Uh, it gives you a sense of less stress and more time. And, you know, I started to put this all together and say, like, you know, it's hard to think about anything where if you go do it for 20 minutes, you will have that degree of benefit, right? Of your immune system looks better, your heart's functioning better, your mind is more, more reason-oriented and more creative, you feel less stress. Um, so yeah, you know, the body of awe is fascinating. Uh, we've just published a paper, Marie Monroe and I, saying it's actually, when you put these benefits together, 
you really can think of awe as the mediator of how we find mental health and physical health, why nature immersion benefits us, why, you know, art therapy or um, psychedelics gives us benefits. So awe is very good for us. Mm. What do you recommend to somebody that lives in an inner city? You know, they work nine to five, they come home, got to take care of the kid. Where am I going to get my awe? Yeah, you know, I, you know, we, we developed an awe walk where people walk in cities and, and beautiful, you know, rural areas. It's a mindset in some sense to go look for awe. And, and it's interesting. Uh, Paul Piff's published a paper, Jake Moskowitz, that um, the poor actually experience more awe. And so it may be the music around them or the contemplative practice or playing pickup basketball, noticing the, the synchronization of it. That was always a source of awe for me. Uh, or the, you know, the ordinary drama out in uh, the life of streets. So there's a lot, you know, one of our key findings is awe is everywhere. You know, it truly is everywhere once you start to think about it. I was volunteering in San Quentin, gave a talk on awe, asked them in a, a, a lapse of reason, like, what's your experience of awe? They gave me the best answers I've ever heard, you know, you know, getting to read the Koran, seeing the light of the San Francisco Bay, my, my celly, my cat, my kid. Um, so it's, it's there to be enjoyed. And part of the reason of the book is to get people to think about that. Yeah. You don't have to go to Big Sur. <laughs> no, you don't. I get naked in a hot tub. That's, right. and, you know, that's fun too. <laughs> yeah. But no, it's really, you know, and we learn that in our everyday awe experiences. I remember acutely one from Beijing where if you've been to Beijing, it has some of the worst air in the world. Um, truly, like when you're there, it's, it's like, it's oppressive. And this student wrote about, you know, walking across a uh, park on a smoggy day and like noticing how the shadows came out of the leaves of the trees. And, and you know, it's like, God, if you can find it there, you can find it almost there. Mm -hmm. Right. Why do you think it took a century from Darwin's expression of the emotions of man and animals, 1870s, really till 1970s with E.L. Wilson and the idea that scientists can study emotions. What happened for a century there? <laughs> it's Just, ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, um, I think that uh, there was this sense, which I think is, has some grounding in it, but is problematic that um, emotions are unstudiable, you know, that you, you can't measure B.F. Skinner inside the black box. You can't measure experience with words. Um, you can't, um, people didn't have the tools, frankly, like uh, cameras to measure behavior, right? Um, you know, the, the, the methodologies weren't in place. I also think that there's something of um, kind of a cultural bias, the cognitive imperialism, if you will, of, you know, that, you know, we got so taken with just what, you know, Danny Kahneman called system two, like just the, what the operations of the mind that we're aware of with language as driving behavior. And that actually is a questionable thesis very often. And we just didn't know how to study kind of these intuitive processes, the feeling processes, the emotion. Uh, in, in really until late 60s, early 70s. And, uh, and you know, I'm the beneficiary of that because otherwise I would have no career. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Well, the whole po positive psychology movement also was what, maybe 1990s, really, when that right. yeah. finally came online. You would think psychologists would have been interested in that, but maybe with the wars and depression and the Holocaust and all that, the initial questions were, what went wrong? What is wrong with yeah. people? Why are they evil? Why did genocide, right. depression, schizophrenia, yeah. just the kind of the bad things. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and we're having this interesting, I'm not sure if you've written about this, but we're having this interesting pendulum shift where just like you said, after world war two, and then, you know, the, the unrest in the streets, the civil rights movement, you know, the racism of the United States in the fifties, um, the social scientists, the big stories were how basically the banality of evil Milgram, right? Just like it's everywhere. It's just what we do. That's, you know, you get a system in place and you're, 
you're um, you're executing with the gas chambers. And we've now seen a, a swing in the other direction of people like Joseph Henrik and David Rand and others who are like this default kindness and cooperation and sharing that you see as an evolutionary dynamic and prerogative that, you know, babies will share. If you share fast, you share more, you first moves cooperation. And my lab, like it's built into the nervous system, a vagus nerve and the like. So yeah, you know, science is always as a uh, part of our culture and, and subject to its trends. And, and now we're in a, a more, a, a different view, which is in some sense overdue. Oh, absolutely. I think so. Also, I think there's an availability heuristic there about what yeah. stands out, the negativity bias. We notice yeah. the bad things. So why do people fall for cults, you know, Jonestown and Heaven's Gate, or why did they uh, fall for Bernie Madoff or Sam Bankman Freed and so on? But in fact, most people don't fall for those kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, most people don't join cults. I mean, how many self-help groups are there? Ten, you know, tens of thousands. And you, you and I can name the four or five that, you know, were famous for people falling for. But in fact, most people don't. I was thinking about this with that George Santos uh, character and he, how he made up all his his uh, his biography. But yeah. and so why didn't people fact check it? Why didn't they? Well, because most people who say they went to college, they really did go to college or you know, they got it, this GPA or they worked at this company. Most people don't just make that kind of shit up. And so it, yeah, it, no. it's, who has time to fact check everything, right? So You know, and I know, and I was, I was talking to Steve Pinker about this, you know, our friend about, you know, this is where science is really useful, but we, as Kahneman and Tversky have shown us, we, we just don't do this intuitively. Like base rates are phenomenal. You know, they are in some sense, ground truth to reality. Like, what are the prevalences of different phenomena? You know, I, for a long time, you know, my first book, Born to be Good, we share, we cooperate. And it'd always be somebody like, yeah, but two weeks ago, this guy stole my burrito, you know? Oh, no. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, but 1,200 burritos went through and weren't stolen. <laughs> right. It right. was a bad, bad day, you know? So, no, I know it's, it's, uh, but that's why we need, Shows like this and writing like yours, and and we need we need to ground it in in you know what I, science and and sort of observations that can uh, keep us honest. Yeah, that default uh, truth default theory. Um, yeah, uh, that Malcolm Gladwell sort of put on the map. You know why do why do people believe Hitler or whatever? Well. <laughs> Because most people are not Hitler, right? And, uh, you know, we just uh, don't have the resources to do that. So in a way, kind of from an evolutionary perspective, you have to mostly trust your fellow group members. Maybe a little trust yeah. with verification, but for the most part, most of them yeah. are going to do the right thing and it's reasonable to trust them. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think that, you know, when you add, and we've worked on this a bit in studies of reputation, like when you add, you know, and you think about the work of, that I was really influenced by Christopher Baum, the reverse hierarchy mm -hmm. and studies of small scale societies, like all the sharing and trust and cooperation that takes place as the default. So I trust that's a sensible assumption. And then the violations become very noteworthy and uh, reputation worthy, gossip worthy. And so, yeah, I think our better tendencies are almost the, the water that, you know, the, the air that we move in that we don't recognize. Okay, let's pull out and look at uh, emotions in general. You can start wherever yeah. you like if you want to start with Darwin and his uh, uh, still misunderstood book that yeah. he only identified six emotions or whatever it was and, and he was rigid about it. What do we, what, how does that science start with understanding emotions in general? Yeah, you know, um, Darwin, there, it's interesting. Historically, uh, there's been a tendency in a lot of great thinkers from, you know, Descartes to, um, uh, you know, David Hume to Adam Smith to Darwin to really think about the emotions as basic organizational states of consciousness, right? That the mind has these states that we move through on a regular basis. They pick up important things about reality. Maybe they animate behavior. And so that's just been a common assumption that Aristotle as well, for example. And Darwin comes along, you know, um, and starts having the sense, you know, he hears 
he gets these challenges to his evolutionary account of um, of behavior, and they start to make the argument, the critiques, the creationist critiques that yeah, you know maybe the you know the physical world has evolved, but the human moral world, the human world of consciousness, the human world of kindness and reverence and beauty didn't evolve. It was given to us by God. And there were really ridiculous uh, sort of anatomical arguments about that. And so Darwin went on a journey and he, you know, he gathered all kinds of observations uh, from his kids to zoos, to uh, people that wrote to him, you know, thousands of observations. And <clears throat> I'll just sort of set it up here, but he writes the expression of emotion in man and animals. And what's interesting about that book, and Frank Solo and I are, are annotating it right now and putting it together for a paper, is, um, you know, he actually, Darwin writes very clear descriptions of 53 mental states. So Darwin thinks that our states of emotion that have been with us through evolution uh, are really complex. They're not just four or five or six. They're 53 states like love and sympathy and reverence and horror and terror. He writes about a lot of continuities across uh, non-human species, from rattlesnakes to geese to chimpanzees. And, you know, I've verified them. They're stunning in how accurate they are, just the physical dynamics of how bees, he said that bees hum in a different way when they're angry, mm. and they do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's unbelievable. I, you know, I look at a bee, I'm like, ah, you know. Um, and then he also says, you know, it's so interesting. There are critiques right now that, you know, oh, he was, a, he thinks it's all universal. No. You know, in fact, that point forgets individual variability is, is the driving force of evolution. And Darwin wrote extensively about that. And then that, that expressions don't serve functions. And Darwin has many observations where he's like, you know, the voice is this language of falling in love and becoming devoted. And, you know, anger displays subordinate other people around the the displayer. So, so <clears throat> what's fascinating, and this is all this is a, I, you know, it's it's so stunning to me, and and literally, just in the last six months, I've I've worked on this, which is Darwin writes about fifty three emotions. I've always read Darwin. Frank Solo and I talk about him. Darwin inspired a lot of my research on awe, compassion. Um, and uh, embarrassment and shame and laughter. Um, and yet the canon in the field of emotion is the inside-out emotions, anger, fear, sadness, disgust, surprise, and joy. Uh, and that's because my mentor, Paul Ekman, who's a hero of mine, got such attention by showing there were six expressions that were universal and all the fights around that that the field forgot everything else. And that's how feel. And you know what's striking, Michael? We, you know, I did a little bit of homework and I read up on different, you know, personal essays of Ekman. He hadn't even read Darwin when he went to New Guinea. Oh my God. <laughs> to do the research. <laughs> and for years I've been teaching like Ekman read Darwin and he goes to New right. Guinea and he tests it and he wins, you know. And it's like, nope, it, it came <laughs> after. So, so we're working on... Um, yeah, I think the field will eventually, 20 years from now, have a much richer story of, that aligns with a lot of what Darwin said. I think that happens a lot where people don't go back to the original source. You just kind of read the encapsulated source. Darwin said this, so I went and tested it. And also yeah. in science, there's that tendency the way papers are written, for example. Here was my methodology. First, I did a background literature search. Then I set up a methodology. Then I ran this experiment, and here's what I found. Of course, it almost never happens like that, right? <laughs> uh, so even even writing a book, so you end up with this kind of caricatured uh, opposite. So, you know, Ekman says, well, I tested Darwin. I found this. And then you have someone like Lisa uh, Feldman Barrett, kind of the person on the other side, saying, oh, no, 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 it's not rigid. I found these exceptions. But of course, yeah. if anyone had read the original book, like you and Sullivan just did, I read that paper that, that Frank sent me, and it's just like, wow, I had no idea either because I haven't read the expression of the emotions very carefully. I kind of flipped through it, no. read a few sections. I remember, ah. I remember Steve Gould said something about it was the first book or one of the first books ever published with photographs. I don't know, yeah. if, I don't know if, yeah. that, if that's true or not, but anyway, I always thought that was interesting. But I mostly just looked at the pictures. <laughs> yeah. 
Me too. <laughs> <laughs> and somewhere on my bookshelves, I have I I Ibel, Ibisfeld's book where he shows photo, yeah the photographs of the Papua New Guineans and people yeah. and Asians and and Caucasians and so on smiling or looking surprised yeah. or whatever. And from that, you just go to oh, okay, so this is universal. And then someone like Lisa comes along and goes, hey, I found three exceptions. Like, okay, now how, how do we deal with that? Well, you guys deal with that uh, quite adequately, that it's not that simple. Okay, so let's, let me ask a simple question. What are emotions for? I, you know, I think emotions do two fundamental things, and there's a ton of research on this, which is they prepare you for specific actions that are beneficial to your social goals in the environment. Uh, so if you look at the rich literature on anger and rage, mm. and Darwin differentiated between the two, and you think about Sarah Brosnan's work of rhesus macaques protesting that they don't get the grapes, right? Mm, oh, yeah. And little babies <laughs> doing temper tantrums and anger displays and anger at work, all of those sort of de cross-development and cross-species expressions of anger are animating actions that say things are unfair, it's got to change, and it tends to change. A lot of good data suggests that it's it serves those goals. And just as importantly, and Jennifer Lerner and I have written a lot about this, as has John Haidt in some sense, which is that our social worlds are really complicated. Uh, obviously, lots of stuff going on relevant to different goals of ours. And emotions organize cognition to attend to goal-relevant uh, dimensions of the social context, right? So we, Jen Lerner and I did work uh, in the judgment decision-making world where if you're really fearful and you're feeling threatened, you're going to be scanning the environment for signs of threat, right? If you're angry, you're going to be looking for signs of who's being unjust to you. And that's fitting for the emotions appraisal of the environment that you've, you're in peril. So look for signs of peril. You may overinterpret, you may get it wrong. You may think a person of color is more dangerous when in fact they're not, right? So the emotions bias us to look for certain inf patterns of information, uh, very often for the good and sometimes very, very often for the bad. So we tend to distinguish emotions from reason, but it, should we yeah. be thinking of it more like a system one, system two, uh, the system one is rapid cognition, kind of an intuition, a heuristic, a shortcut. Are emotions more like that? Yeah. Yeah, I would really, you know, you always have to think about emotions as like, man, they go from the immune system, which is ancient and oxytocin, to metaphor in the cortex, right? So that's a lot of levels. And I really, you know, Kahneman has system one, deep intuition, feeling, system two, rational, you know, explanation, probabilistic reasoning and the, and the like. I, you know, Mark Solms <clears throat> has this book, The Hidden Spring on Consciousness where he really says that feeling is consciousness, right? My feeling of enthusiasm for this con conversation is how I feel about it. And he's really been influenced by new thinking and consciousness studies of Markovian blankets, that they're just all these layers of representation that go from very basic sensation, oh, that's warm, to perception, that's my friend's hand, to bodily feeling, oh, that's calming me down to up into the amygdala, you know, oh, it's a friend, to cortex, uh, oh, that's my high school friend, and we're embracing, right? I, I think emotions are the, have multiple layers mm. that are constantly going back and forth. Good luck studying that. <laughs> <laughs> system one, system two, yeah. in some sense, is, is uh, after the fact theoretical construct that says, well, this is about how we can study it in the lab, which is fast stuff and slower stuff. Mm. Right, so it's more of a quantitative difference, and at some point we draw the line and say, that's a yeah. thing, we reify yeah. it as a thing. That's jealousy, that's love, that's guilt, or right. whatever. So I guess the evolutionary question is, why should there be a sense of guilt or shame or pride and joy at all? Why would that even be there? Admitting, yeah. uh, even while acknowledging that cultures can tweak it, cult cultures yeah. can tell you to be feel guilty about this or about that, and that varies, but why is the guilt there at all? Yeah. That question is, you know, really the question, <clears throat> that, that question <coughs> gets me choked up thinking about it, Michael. <laughs> um, you know, that simple question, why do we have guilt or shame or compassion? Um, 
that's been the you know defining question in some sense for my 20 years, 25 years of studying emotions. And, you know, we got locked in this fight or flight view of the emotions. Amygdala, Jolodoo, and Ekman, and cortisol, and it's all about self, right? And then along come veins of evolutionary thinking that say, man, we're this hyper-social species, E.O. Wilson, you know, uh, the cultural evolution people. Like, we need to be part of a collective to deal with survival issues and, and more specific studies. We respond to the cold by huddling. We respond to food scarcity by sharing. We, you know, Sarah Blaffer Hurdy, we alloparent. We take care of lots of vulnerable people around us. So those evolutionary arguments put together this idea that, you know, we are, our defining strength in some sense is our capacity to be collective or we. And what you need is a whole new suite of adaptations that help us fold into groups and to serve and to cooperate. And emotions are part of that story, right? Guilt is about, oh, I've, I've harmed somebody, I'll make amends. Shame is about, I've not lived up to my group's expectations about character. Um, you know, anger is about social protest and injustice. Uh, and awe, I argue in the book, is about it animates behaviors like the feeling that I'm part of a collective, the sense of social integration, the altruism that makes me a strong group member. And that has these benefits that evolutionary types like um, uh, Elliot Sober and David Sloan Wilson have been writing about. Like, this is how we become tribe, uh, for better and for worse, is through the emotions. And do we wear our emotions on our face and in our body language so that other fellow group members can see, oh, okay, he feels guilty. That's good because <laughs> I don't want him to do this again. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and that's one thesis in the, you know, the expression literature is there are these signals that sort of restore balance in social relationships. We have a paper, like if I show embarrassment and shame, other people forgive me. They like me. They'll cooperate with me. Um, you know, Jess Tracy does very elegant work at UBC, University of British Columbia. If I show pride and sort of expand my body, other people will be like, that woman knows what she's doing. I'll, I'll do that, right? <laughs> that they have status and knowledge. So the emotions are these uh, pieces of information, Gerben van Cleef has argued, that smooth out and structure social interactions. You know, we did research showing, you know, if I show uh, sexual cues of desire, of lip licks and lip puckers and the like, uh, my partner's more interested in me sexually. So. Mm. You know, the, they are, I, you know, the quote that really gets it, and thank you for mentioning him, is Eibel Eibelsfeld. Mm. Emotions are the grammar of social living. Mm, Ex that's beautiful. Expression st structures right. how we, we get things done. Right, right. So we have those emotions uh, because we're a social primate species in which there's a certain yeah. percentage of freeloading, cheating, lying, mm. and so yeah. on. I guess the argument would be that it, it's too much for natural selection to eliminate every single last bully, free rider, and so on. A group can tolerate a certain amount of this. This is Christopher Baum's research on these yeah. uh, hunter-gatherer tribes. What they do, you know, when they deal yeah. with these people, you start with gossiping about them and, and shunning right. them and shaming them. And when that doesn't work, ultimately, you get capital punishment. You take the guy out on a hunt and come back without him. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's yeah. crazy. But... I know. Oh. <laughs> but, 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 so there's always going to be the Bernie Madoffs, you know, there's just a handful of them and we can tolerate them, but you got to have a system in place. And, and that's yeah. what these moral emotions are about. Yeah. And that's the, you know, you know, the question of the authenticity of the signal is a big debate and it, and the empirical literature fits it pretty well, which is expressive behavior correlates with feelings of love or kindness or compassion, 0.25, 0.3. Um, and that means there are going to be people who can exploit that. That like, oh, I know how to look compassionate. I just like look into the camera and oh, you know, and I can fake it and exploit people. But on balance, like you said earlier, it's it's a good assumption to assume that that it is a sincere tendency associated with the expressive behavior. And then you need these systems to catch the cheaters and, and gossip and the like come into play. Mm. Okay, on the physiology question, I'm walking down the path, there's a rattlesnake, and I 
immediately jump and run. And then I all of a sudden am, am you know, kind of overwhelmed with the emotion of it. Was it the physiology that made me feel the emotion? Did I have the emotion and that triggered the heart rate and the stress hormones or whatever? Or what do we know about the sequence there? Yeah, that's almost unanswerable. Okay. And, <laughs> you know, we, <laughs> because what that needs is a kind of methodology where you can measure, you know, millisecond by millisecond shifts in heart rate and then track, have people report on their experience, have a sense of the context. And, you know, reporting on experience, I have a lot of doubts about because as do other people in the field, it's often retrospective. It happens a minute after the event. A lot of stuff goes in between. So that's, we haven't made progress on the order question of what comes first, physiology or subjective conscious experience. Um, but we'll get there. You know, the, the measures of physiology are more sophisticated. The statistics we use to, to model it are. Uh, but it's, we're still pretty primitive on that very hard question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, some of those didn't survive the replication crisis, right? There was the one where if you hold the pin in your mouth yeah. horizontally, into, it forces your mouth into a smile, you'll find a joke funnier, whereas you, you pucker your lips and hold the pin, you know, uh, where it's sticking straight out, then you, you assess the joke differently. Or the power pose. I remember when I saw that talk at TED, yeah. You know, and ap yeah. afterwards, everyone's walking around with their shoulders back and their head up and like, <laughs> oh, I got my power pose going. The theory being you will then you, you you fake it till you make it. You you act it and then you will come to believe it yourself. And then that'll yeah. influence the people around you. I think those haven't held up too well, right? Yeah, th those have not. Those are in question. But there's a really striking new science of embodiment that I think mm, will, emotional embodiment, you know, make right. re really interesting progress. Uh you know, um, Hugo Critchley and Sarah Garfinkel in England are my favorites. And so they find, for example, check this finding out. Um, you know, we know sympathetic autonomic nervous system, your stress response in your heart rate and breathing and the like is associated with threat. And they find that how I perceive threat in the environment correlates, I think it's with a certain pattern of blood pressure at a particular instant in the blood pressure cycle. So that's telling us that forms of consciousness like threat, seeing threat out in, in, in a financial investment, for example, are tracking very subtle fluctuations in the body. You know, we had a finding that vagal tone, you know, the activation of the vagus nerve, this big bundle of nerves that starts up here, wanders into your chest, slows your heart rate, calms the body is associated with engagement, correlates with the judgment that you're similar to other people. Um, and that that's impressive, right? That a part of physiology is tracking these higher order uh, system one type judgments, system two type judgments. And, but the science is very young. So we just have to see where it goes. Mm. Yeah. Back to the evolutionary continuity question yeah. with emotions and other animals. Uh, I remember when Jane Goodall was writing about emotions expressed by chimps and she was criticized by mostly older male Scientists going, yeah. oh, you're anthropomorphizing. That's a typical woman thing to do or something like that. Yeah. And then when that book, When Elephants Grieve came out, I read that. And I thought, yeah, yeah, of course they do. You know, you can see it right yeah. there. I've seen my yeah. dog grieve or be embarrassed or whatever. I mean, come on. But there was that yeah. kind of sense in science. We just don't do that. You, you can just put a number on it. And don't call that chimp, you know, Fufu or whatever her name was. You know, it's number <laughs> 69P. <laughs> right? I, <laughs> oh, I didn't thought about that. That's terrible. Yeah. But that's how it used to be, right? So Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and it's back to the question of, you know, and, and, and awe is a good example of there has been this hesitation to understand the passions and the feelings and the emotions, that they, they are part of some other system that resists definitions and measurements and inferences. Um, and in, fact, in point of fact, you know, that's not true. We can measure them as well as almost anything. They have reliable patterns. They tell us a lot. You can see them in other species really mm -hmm. clearly. You'd be blind not to see, you know, and Darwin wrote about this and, and he was right that, you know, the, the patterns of, of tail movements signal, there's incredible work on tail movements signaling oh, right. affection from Japan, you know, right. dogs. So, so, you know, right. If the that is, it's, that's right. If the tail wags more to the left versus the right, when you're looking yeah. down on it, it's fearful or friendly. 
something like that because yeah. it engages the left hemisphere versus the right hemisphere. I, I mean, this is an amazing grammar of social living. Yeah, that we are just starting to figure out, and and I think, I think you know the Western individualistic male, if you will, mindset that the idea that there's a grammar, emotional grammar of social living, is counter to. I figure it all up at, out up in my cortex. Um, and so we've been late to the game, but we're making a lot of progress. Mm. Is this your understanding of what Hume meant when he said the, the reason is always the slave of the passions? Yeah. I, you know, I look at the emotion literature that I've been part of, you know, please go see Alan Cowan's work, 20 different emotions, nicely computationally matched, mapped. We've got data, you know, facial expression, 60% universal, 70% vocalizations across cultures. We just published Nature and Human Behavior, 79% universal. Wow. These are universal languages of how we get along. And, and we're just starting to figure out all the complicated layers of processes that are part of emotion. Um, and, and there's a lot that, that uh, we know and much that remains to be discovered. And how do you distinguish between happiness and I don't know what meaningfulness or purposefulness yeah. in life? Yeah, that that's a big one, you know, and it's relevant to all. You know, the the field of happiness has focused on hedonics. What do I enjoy? Uh, am I happy with my life? Happiness or life satisfaction? And then Crystal Park and others have started to like say, hey, you know, there's this other realm that's like purpose and meaning and and often it's not so positively valence. Like when my brother uh, passed away and I was grieving, I was, I did not feel good. I felt horrible, but I was definitely learning things about life that, that changed my life forever. Meaning about, you know, my point in the world and what he meant to me and what family is and so forth. Um, so meaning is, is really about your purpose your existential purpose. Happiness is sort of like, do things feel good? Do you feel good about your life? Does this cup of tea in my, um, my uh, carrier here help uh, feel, taste good? Really different things. And so short -term, glad you pointed out. Short-term versus long-term. Yeah, and you know, um, how we enjoy things in the moment, short-term versus what does this all build to in the end, uh, long-term. Yeah, I think that's a fair summary. Like I remember uh, when Dan Gilbert gave a talk where we were both speaking at a conference. This is before his Stumbling on Happiness book, which I really loved. Yeah. But he said something about, uh, you know, having children does not make parents happier. And in fact, they don't become back up to their level of happiness till the kids move out. And I, and I just remember thinking, that's not why you have kids. It's not like so you walk around in a blissful state. <laughs> I mean, you've kind of missed the point. If you, But I think it was that it was the wrong word. I agree. I agree, right? That, you know, and, and I think that's part of the problem of the happiness literature. That finding, which has been contested, uh, it's probably the result of people reporting, do I feel good about life? Am I having fun? Yeah, well, of right. course, when you're sleep disrupted and your kid's <laughs> vomiting on you, yeah. this is not fun. But if you had asked, do I feel a lot of love? Do I feel like I'm serving something? Do I feel compassion? The results would have been different. Mm -hmm. and, and we're actually working on new measures of well-being that they get the richness that you're pointing to. Well, that's back to the how, how reliable is self-report data. It depends what you're yeah. asking, right? So yeah. they have these, you know, with the little pagers they used to do, you know, every hour randomly throughout the day. How are you feeling now? How are you feeling now? Well, it's kind of, what do you mean by feeling? <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, if I'm out on a hard bike ride, and I'm suffering, I'm not happy, but, you know, I love doing it. But yeah. it, happy or how am I feeling is not really quite the right question. It is. And then you think about, you know, you think about the actual words of one of the most widely used questions like, are you how satisfied are you with your life right now? And and yeah, th there is cross temporal reliability it correlates 0.6 if you measure that a, a two weeks later. But well, what's that really tell you? Right. Um, and should would we rather be assessing the whole period of time with multiple measures? Obviously, yes. So I, I, I'm glad I hear some skepticism in your, <laughs> you're thinking about that field. And I think it's, it's, uh, justified. Yeah. Well, when, uh, when I was writing, uh, heavens on earth, thinking about these questions about, you know, he heavens on earth, you know, what do you got to yeah. do to lead a, you know, happy life or fulfilled life? 
and the the brief literature search I did, um, uh, Christ, uh, not Christopher Obama, who um, who's a psychologist that wrote that book, Evil, and um, on self esteem. Right. Um, shoot, Baumeister. Yeah, Baumeister, Roy Ba. He's such yeah. an interesting uh, thinker and writer on this. That yeah. So he he was making a distinction between short term and long term, and about me versus about somebody not me. Uh, as yeah. making that distinction. You can have both. That's fine. Good. You know, go out with your friends and have, have a, a nice dinner and a good time. Next day, that, that's gone. So that yeah. little bit of happiness is gone. But I'll always have, you know, having been a caretaker for two of my parents and so on, uh, you know, that, that I'll just carry with me. So that's a more long term. Yeah. No, and I think we, you know, so much of the science of happiness, so much of the science of emotion, so much of the science of awe is just short term. I got somebody in a lab for half an hour. I do some stuff, have them report what happens in the trajectory of life. And, and we, we don't have clear pictures on, on really big questions. Mm -hmm. But I like the idea of your everyday awe, just finding yeah. maybe yeah. just once a day, just stop and go, okay, I'm going to spend 10 minutes right here looking at whatever I'm doing uh, and, just, and just take myself out of this other world where I'm just bleh, doing regular stuff. Like the, the, yesterday, driving down the hill from my house, and because of the rain, there's this new little waterfall that's never I've never mm. seen. I've been here in Santa Barbara six years, and oh. uh, so and, and and I noticed when I pulled over, other people were pulling over to take pictures of this. <laughs> now, by waterfall standards, this is a puny, wimpy little waterfall. It's nothing, but it's never been there, right? It's like oh, and you just kind of and the hills are super green because of all the grass from the rain, and it's like wow, okay, this is a moment. And so I pulled over and I took some I pick iPhone pics and. And it's like, I thought, oh, oh, Dacker would be very proud of me. I'm getting my everyday awe, 10 minutes of awe. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, you know, for our re listeners, you know, it was a really striking finding that people feel awe two to three times a week, you know, and I didn't expect that. And they're just finding it in just exactly what you described, like just being open to discoveries and suddenly like, oh my goodness, look at, you know, look at the moon right now or. Or um, look at the person playing the violin in the streets. And so there's a lot of awe around us that we're often not quite open to. And uh, given its health benefits, uh, I turn to more everyday awe in my own life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's good. And, and your book really does that well. Okay, lightning round as we wrap up here. Just a couple of big questions okay. since I got a great mind with me here. Uh, the problem of consciousness, the hard problem of consciousness you know, so your uh, your dis whole discussion of emotions really brings this up. How do you know somebody is feeling that? And 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 what would I mean? How do you go from molecules, hormones, and, and whatever swapping across synaptic gaps to experience of awe? Oh man, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, there's there's the the compromise solution, which is, and we've worked hard on this with Alan Cowan and others, like. If you measure consciousness enough rich, richly, rather than these impoverished self-report measures that you've been pointing out, um, you can capture consciousness, you know, subjective feeling pretty well. We have a paper I think will get published um, on our conscious experience of aesthetic emotion in response to paintings. And if you measure, you know, each painting, you, you get them to report on 50 different semantic terms, you can really predict how much they are moved by that painting, 0.95, right? So you can get there. Does that correlate with physiology? It's a slightly different question. Um, but still, um, you know, that, that um, still does, doesn't uh, get the full <laughs> force answer to this. And I think that we're going to need, you know, new kinds of methodologies to solve the hard problem of consciousness where we measure the molecules of the brains and the bodies and then map it into a person's use of words, ideally with narratives, and then have a way of, you know, maybe through big data or, you know, et cetera, where how those words fit into the cultural meaning of, of those words at that time. I, th I think it's almost tractable, but there will still be mysteries. Mm. It reminds me of a, another one of these TED-like conferences where one of the speakers was the New York Times editor for like perfumes. I mean, just like yeah. like reviewed perfumes. <clears throat> I've never even heard of such a thing, but okay, there it is. And he had yeah. and he had like this rich vocabulary of words you use to describe ah. a smell. And it's like, yeah. yeah, how would I describe a smell? I have no idea. <laughs> but the way he used the words, I thought, yeah, okay, it's kind of woody or it's 
it's you know it's this or that and like okay yeah. i think i'm getting that <laughs> barely yeah. <laughs> yeah no and and that's that's a lesson to us which is you know maybe we should be studying the experts that have these rich vocabularies that really see how their rich vocabularies track all the subjective uh processes associated with the mm. experience or like that movie sideways paul giamatti and yeah. <laughs> Hayden Church go on a boys oh, I love that weekend, but it's kind of a send up of the of the wine culture and you know and and the Paul Giamatti characters you know trying to teach him like what to s sniff. You, you hold it up there and you say, okay, I, I'm getting a little whiff of this woody color and then the flower and then this and then that and, and the Hayden Church character is like, what are you talking about? He's, are you chewing? Dude, are you yeah. chewing gum? <laughs> He's still <"I'm> chewing gum. <laughs> <That's> so funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. Hard problem with consciousness. Yeah. It may just be uh, what Thomas Nagel called one thought too many. Right. Uh, yeah. It's just it yep. just is, uh, it, you know, yeah. full stop. It's like, why is there gravity? It just is. It just yeah. it's in the nature of the universe. Yep. <laughs> OK, what I are, agree. What about uh, free will and determinism? Where how do you uh, work on that problem? Or how do you think about that? Uh, I guess I would say that, you know, in the both, you know, thinking about the evolutionary perspective and all these complicated processes of natural selection working on us in the moment, uh, that it's pretty deterministic. And I'd put my money on free will being largely a subjective phenomenon. <laughs> and that, you know, once, um, once you consider the deep distal sources of evolution and sociological sources and life historical sources, not a lot of choice left after that so that but we are convinced of our free will so at least in the west so it's a useful fiction uh, in that sense yeah with, with a little bit of truth a little bit grain of truth well here's how i think about it that you know we of course we Tell me. We, we live in a determined universe okay it's mechanical and so on and we are part of that but we are also aware of all the impinging or at least some of the impinging causal vectors pushing us this way or that yeah and then we yeah. can we make a choice now who's making that choice well i am Okay, well, the self is an illusion. Well, yeah, maybe, but it's a good illusion. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a yeah. it's a cluster of characteristics that I call me. All right, so that and and somebody's got to interact with the world, and that's me inside my skull. So as the variables come at me, I can go left or right or whatever. Could I have? Yeah. Could I have done otherwise? This is the ultimate question. Could you have done otherwise? Well, if it's like Steve Gould's rerun the tape of life and play it back again. Well, D Dan Denna pointed out, if it's a read-only memory tape, no, it, it has to unfold exactly that way because it's a recording, right? It's already happened. So what he really meant was, though, if we start it over and just let it play out, and, and you know, obviously it's not going to come out exactly the same. And in that sense, you can't rerun the tape. You can't play it back again and see yeah. if you would have done the same thing. Would you have gone to this yeah. school instead of that school or married this person instead of that person? But we, you can't do that. There's no computer that could ever do that. So in a way, time moves forward from past to future and you're on the journey and you're the one making yeah. choices, okay? Yeah. I, I remember yeah. last time I did this and that got me in trouble with my spouse or whatever. So now I'm not gonna do that again. I'm gonna do this other thing, right? Whatever it is. And so somebody's making a choice there. Somebody's evaluating the options. Yeah, you know, and, and it, it, what it suggests is that, you know, the different domains of conscious experience operate according to different laws. Some may be Newtonian, others quantum physical, others, you know, de deterministic, others free will. And, you know, in the world of narrative, right, which you're pointing to, sense of self as narrative and story, maybe that's where free will is. And then in the choices that we make, right, the reactions we have, you know, given all the sociological, economic, evolutionary, genetic forces, it may be different. And so I think we always have to think about domain. Mm. Yeah. Then since you talked about restorative justice in the book, which I, I really like that section, yeah. um, Thank you. Uh, are we going through something of a restorative justice revolution with the uh, Black Lives Matter, George Floyd, the Me Too movement, everything that's happened in about the last five to seven years? Yeah, it's it's profound. Um, the kind of the interest in you know the different forms of justice, restorative justice being making amends for historical, personal, societal harm. You know, in prisons, it's about prisoners making amends for the harm they've they've perpetrated. Um, yeah, I think that it is. You know, I tend to 
uh, abide by Steve Pinker's sense that history is moving towards less violence, um, more justice. I think some of the data, if you just look at the base rates, just life expectancies of people of color 60 years ago today, um, and even in sort of shifting um, attitudes recently towards the incarcerated who I've worked with. So I do, I think, um, I th George Floyd was, you know, the, I think was the most important political event in the last decade uh, in the United States. And it's shifting. It's just a different world. So uh, with challenges and a long history of racism. Is that what you mean by a kind of a sense of awe through moral beauty? Yeah, very much so. I mean, I think that the feeling around, you know, George Floyd was horror unbelievable horror and then then the the inspiration of the black lives matter movement um and then you know the the broader feeling of new moral concepts emerging in the local social actions of me too and you know Harvey Weinstein and George Floyd Greta Thunberg right just like suddenly these moral you know coming out of the blue totally unpredictable no Political scientists would have ever modeled that. And suddenly, you know, the Greta Thunberg has inspired a movement that has a lot of momentum. And, and, and that is the feeling of awe at the moral beauty of, of people. Mm -hmm. Well, there's some a sense of progress over time where we yeah. did not used to put ourselves into yeah, other people's right. shoes. So how does that happen? You know, there's top down. You can have laws. The, you know, the Supreme Court votes that gay marriage is the law of the land. Done. Okay. You're not right. going to do this anymore. <clears throat> now, I would prefer it come from the bottom up, right? We just change the yeah. the norms and customs and the way we talk about other people. And that's language, right? So you right. don't, you don't use the N word anymore. We don't use the B word for women and so on. And that's just kind of changed slowly. I always like this example from Richard Dawkins where he, he says he could identify within a decade of when a novel was written going back, you know, like two centuries yeah, uh, based sure. on how they talk about Jews and blacks and women and so on. And it's like, yeah. So how does that change? Uh, you know, it's hard to pinpoint, right? Just, yeah. you know, TV script writers just use different language and we all kind of listen to that or the music changes or cartoon editorial cartoons or I don't know what. Yeah. Well that, you know, we're, you know, in awe as a player there where Jonah Berger's done work. What do we like to share in terms of New York Times stories? It tends to be inspiring and awe-filled. And awe so I think that, you know, um, in some sense, when we get to cultural evolution, how do we change our ideas about gender or sexuality or social class or what, what should we do with prisoners or what do we do with the, the people with neurodiverse tendencies? Uh, I, you know, it's interesting. I, th I think, Michael, we're arriving at a hypothesis here, which is it's through the awe of moral beauty, right? That you, we as a collective are destabilized by somebody like the response to George Floyd. And then, and then it spreads and new ideas emerge and protests happen or innovation happens. And so I think we need, you and I need to collaborate. Because <laughs> that okay. would be, that sounds I good. like bottom up social change too. Yeah. I think, yeah, you know, so well, you, Howard's you, in has a, You wrote about that in the book about uh, what it takes, how many people in a stadium it takes to get a wave going. It's not many, right? Yeah, it's 20, you 20 know, 100,000 people, 100, people <laughs> you know, can like, if you just like do that with 20 people, they'll, you can get 100,000 people. So, you know, <clears throat> it's, it's uh, worth considering and being strategic about. Interesting. All right, last question. So you come back a century from now, mm -hmm. and what is what does uh, psychology look like in the study of all these these huge topics? Well, I think what it looks like is um, I think that the um, I think that there are going to be ways where we get close to the hard problem of consciousness of such sophisticated measures. You know, when you think about digital footprints and big data and using words and language to represent neurophysiological sensation and feeling, I think, and then the advances in the study of um, uh, physiology, we'll, we'll start to really say some interesting things. Oh, that's what I wanted um, to ask you about was AI. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> because that's yeah. part of our future, right? Are you worried? It, it are, you, are you worried about AI? You know, there's that kind of Bostrom uh, level of concern. Yeah, I'm not as worried about it as um, other people. Um, it, you know, it all depends on what we do with it, obviously. AI, you know, I do work with um, Hume AI, and which is just, you know, automatically coding facial emotion, vocal emotion. There are a lot of good uses to, to that. You can be less, we could produce a less biased society. We wouldn't be suspending young African-American boys for, you know, for speaking up. Uh, as they are, if if we had some sense of an objective read of their emotion, women are misdiagnosed for their pain. Uh, that's easy to detect with AI. You you just put away a uh, male surgeon's bias. Um, so I'm not as worried about AI as the uh, the doom and gloom people. Um, I'm more worried about you know what the new technologies are taking us away from. Um, like immediate social interaction and getting outdoors and the like. The social media, you mean? Yeah, yeah. So is the data, do you think the data is pretty clear that um, this this kind of spike in um, depression, anxiety, cutting, self-suicidal uh, ideation and so on, particularly among teenagers, especially girls, I don't know, age 13 to 19 or 20 or so, more, more in girls than boys, but it's all gone up across the board. You know, the, the kind of competing hypotheses, it's, you know, it's just social media time in general, just screen time in general versus specific things like Facebook and being feeling uh, phobo, like fe feeling being left out or, or yeah. you're missing out and yeah. so on. Uh, and if that's true, what, you know, should we regulate it? Should parents, what, yeah. you know, what do you uh, yeah. advise to parents? Yeah, I, I speak to parents a lot and, you know, um, and I, I, you know, I have looked at the papers, Gene Twenge and others, recent 2020 papers. Um, and there are correlations there, uh, just as you're saying, you know, and whether pinpointing the specific content in a post to a child's suicidal ideation, I'm not sure we're there yet. Um, but it's there. Uh, and it, it is problematic. And so and, and I worry profoundly about it. Um, you know, and so I tell parents, you know, to I tell parents, Treat the new social media like hard drugs, right? <laughs> that, wow. Like parents used to, which is, this is dangerous stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, it is addictive. I don't think it's dopamine addictive. I think it's, it's a different kind of addiction. Um, you know, the core principle that everybody champions of like, teach kids to use it to their, make it good for them, right? So at, that's a contemplative act of like, is this Instagram post? Should I tune into what's it, what am I doing this or am I mindlessly scrolling? So I talk about that. And then I, I really feel um, I would challenge the, the assumptions out there that, oh, it, it's a nice replacement for the real thing, that it's a good replacement for being physically with your friends, that it's a good replacement for playing real baseball, or it's a good replacement for being in an actual art museum or in a national park. And I think that's a dangerous idea. So, and it's out there, um, yeah, and, yeah. and unacceptable. Yeah. I just thought of that. That's part of your, you're not going to get everyday awe if you're not out there <laughs> engaging in the and world I, physically. I joke about this, but you know, we surveyed 2,600 people around the world and there, are, you know, no one mentioned this <laughs> as a source right. of awe, even right. though they look at it nine hours a day. <laughs> and this company really wants you make, to make you think it's about awe. You know, no one <laughs> right. mentioned it. Right. So, and it's because it's small and you can't type. And, <laughs> but, but, but that there's an important point there that we need to get back to what evolution gave us, Michael, which is incredible social interactions, amazing cultural forms at scale. Mm. Well, I forgot to I ask about like the old... difference between uh, wanting and liking in this sense. Yeah, a... well, wanting. Wanting is um, dopamine based, you know, can't bearage. It's like, I'm going after things. Liking is opiate based. It's like, ah, oh, I'm savoring this good thing. I want the nice walk in the woods. Now I'm in the woods, I'm savoring it. And they're really so different awe physiological. Is, awe is more liking than wanting. I don't know. I, oh. I, I would oh. say awe is more, uh, it, did you say wanting? Uh, liking. I would probably. No, you'd say more wanting. I don't know. You know, Oz, <laughs> so, 
Yeah. It is. And it does because it's out in this own space of like, it's mysterious and I, I'm curious about it. I don't know what this is. So uh, probably a different neurophysiological system altogether. Yeah. Yeah, it could be. All right, Dacker, that was a great conversation. I think we've hit, uh, we've hit most of the big topics. The book, again, is Awe, The New Science of Everyday Wonder and How It Can Transform Your Life. There's that beautiful cover. Go out into the woods. Go out and find some everyday awe. <laughs> uh, what What's next on your... Well, you have a bunch of research projects you've uh, ongoing that you've already mentioned. What would the next big book be? Uh, I think the next big book would be about you know, I'm really interested in transcendent states more broadly, mm. ecstasy, beauty, the absurd, uh, and just figuring out why humans not only have awe, but they have this whole realm of the imagination that, um, that, that takes us to very interesting places. You should go to the cathedrals of Europe and measure people when they're in the cathedral versus outside of it. I do this every, my wife's from Cologne, Germany. So the dome there is, uh -huh. Uh, just magnificent. It's incredible. And he, you know, I'm just an atheist, whatever, but I, I walk in there and I'm just like, Oh, like you said, Whoa. <laughs> you know, I was going to do it at Sagrada Familia. We had some students there in, mm. in Barcelona, but people are like clouded and oh, right. it was kind of a football match. So, <laughs> That's but I hear funny. you, I would love to do yeah, that. Yeah, no, it's uh, I mean, even the stained glass windows, they're designed in yeah. a way that, you know, the light kind of flows through at certain different times of day. No, man, it's... I mean, those guys, they figured that out centuries ago, long before scientists like you came along. You know, this is what works. <laughs> it is. We're a poor approximation. <laughs> That's right. All right, Dagger, thanks a lot. All right, Michael.